Hey there, and welcome to my channel. Today I want to talk about Blue Mage, and more specifically, explore why the Blue Mage failed in Final Fantasy XIV. But I really don't like generally ranty videos, and that's not going to be the point of this video. I want to take a look at the scientific principles of motivation and gamer theory and what retains players and what motivates players to do what they do, and see how this all works scientifically with the Blue Mage, or rather in this instance, how they kind of go at odds with one another and why the Blue Mage kind of hit a wall. So I've been really sitting on the fence in general if I should be bringing in some relevant science and actual research into some of my videos and so this video is going to be my first real attempt at doing that here. So of course it's not going to be an exhaustive dissertation on the topic or anything like that but I still think it could spark some insight and interest in the topic and I think that it is really relevant in this instance. So that being said I will be covering the following in this video. First off, we're going to start with the history of the Blue Mage. Second of all, we're going to go into the science of motivation, then a primer on Bartle's player types, and then a primer on the motivations to play in MMORPGs by Nick Yi. Fifthly, we're going to go into the current state of the Blue Mage, and we're going to then be talking afterwards about why the Blue Mage doesn't really work out. So diving into the history of the Blue Mage, the Blue Mage was first introduced in Final Fantasy V as one of the main staple job classes. Really fresh and unique take on the ability acquisition method where you learn certain abilities by being hit by them from opponents. Likewise, the Blue Mage has been seen in many other beloved games of the franchise such as Final Fantasy VIII's Quistus using blue magic as her limit break, and Final Fantasy X's Kamari who could learn the enemy abilities using Lancep and then use them on others. It's made an appearance through many other games such as the Final Fantasy Tactics series, but probably most familiar to people who are playing Final Fantasy XIV its appearance in Final Fantasy XI. Final Fantasy XI was the first Final Fantasy MMORPG and in many ways XIV is the successor of Final Fantasy XI. Many players of XIV came from XI and due to it being the same genre stuck for it for many years now. In XI the Blue Mage was first seen with the Treasures of At Ergon expansion that was launched back in April 2006. This class did emphasize the core traits of learning abilities for monsters and then adding them to its core kit. In Final Fantasy XI you could also quote unquote set them by allocating a certain number of so-called blue magic points, and a deep discussion of that system is really out of scope for this video, but I think it's extremely important and really pertinent to what we're talking about right now to say that the blue mage could pick and choose very specific abilities at the cost of not being able to use certain other abilities, so it was definitely about choice and what you are going to take and what you aren't. But what really made this system and the blue mage stand out wasn't just the fact that you could pick and choose abilities in isolation, but rather the system was also in tandem with the fact that the blue mage abilities varied widely in their use. For a full list of them, if you're curious, I'm just going to throw it here and in the description. The Blue Mage had self buff spells such as Cocoon that enhanced their defense, making them significantly more tanky, or Triumphant Roar that would increase their attack, or Magic Barrier. Though it really should be said that the Blue Mage could share their buffs with allies using the Diffusion ability. Hard crowd control abilities like Sheep Song would inflict sleep on enemies, and then they even had abilities that would help them support allies such as Magic Fruit, Wild Carrot, and then they also had the Regeneration ability that would gradually restore HP, or White Wind that would restore the HP of all party members. Of course, with the Blue Mage you also had extremely potent damaging spells like Paling Savo, and the Lightning, and Searing Tempest. This ultimately gave people the ability to combine certain sets of abilities together that would let them utilize a very specific playstyle that was tailored made to the person they want to play. Whether the Blue Mage wanted to act as a tank, DPS, or support, all depended on whatever that player wanted. Likewise, they could even define subclasses as a special feature in Final Fantasy XI that would even further let them tailor their Blue Mage to their one playstyle. Such as for me, going Blue Mage, I'd be picking up the healing spells and a bunch of DPS enhancing moves to spread around to allies. Kinda like the Astrologian card system or like the Bard buffs. And then I'd be subclassing the White Mage that would give me more access to healing options or the Bard that would give me more buffing options. Knowing me, probably Bard. But bringing it back to Final Fantasy XIV and why this is relevant is because the Blue Mage could basically be summed up by two core features. First of all, it learns its abilities from monsters. Second of all, and probably most importantly, it picks and chooses between the various abilities. Whether they are healing, DPS, or tanking, or a hybrid of all of them, you really have that choice factor. And it should actually be really emphasized here that Final Fantasy XIV doesn't have any hybrid classes. While you could argue that the Dancer or the Red Mage does dip a little bit, those classes are also very, very comfortably entrenched in the DPS role, and they aren't really infringing on others. 
So with the history covered, let's talk about science. When it comes to getting people to do things, motivation is a massively critical core component of it, if not the thing of it. If people aren't motivated to do something, they simply won't. From the motivational interviewing, if this is a clinical mental health course citation, it works for the purposes of this, and anyhow, the term motivation refers to factors that activate direct and sustained goal-directed behaviors, motives, and are the whys of behavior, the needs, what wants, and drive behavior, and explain what we do. We don't actually observe a motive, rather, we infer that one exists based on the behavior that we observe. And then this leads into discussion that you need to basically activate a behavior by making the decision to do it, you persist it in continued effort towards that goal, and then the intensity of how much you continue to do it and persist in it basically is going to be the intensity component. For all intents and purposes here, well, I'm not going to directly be saying this is going to be like the intensity component or the persistent component or the activation component. I am going to definitely make sure that like I say right now that these are kind of like underlying topics. If you never have a reason to even activate it, then you're not going to do it. And if you don't have a point to do it, well, you're not going to do it. We should really delve a little bit and cover just gently the five different theories of motivation. And these can have some levels of overlap, but in general we're going to kind of treat them as separate entities because they are separate theories. And first of all, we have incentive motivation, which basically means that people are motivated to do something for external rewards. In this instance, external rewards means in-game loot, cosmetics, and other things that they can collect. So for Final Fantasy XIV, that means things like tome stones, eardrops, and cosmetics. Second, we have drive theory that basically means that you have some sort of need that you don't have satisfied right now, so you're motivated to do something in order to meet that need. But as this article states, this is probably more rooted in physiological needs. Third of all, we have arousal theory of motivation that can be hashed up as people like being stimulated, and engaged, and if a person is engaged enough, then they will seek activities to engage themselves. On the flip side, if something isn't engaging, then it's not going to be done for them to get them engaged, unless that person really intensely wants to unwind. Fourth, we have the approach and avoidance theory, which in my opinion is pretty similar to the incentive motivation, but if you want to approach good things, you're going to go for them. But the reverse of it is that you're going to want to avoid negative outcomes, such as I, I don't want to lose out on this week's tombstone cap because then I won't be able to get gear and so that's going to be a consequence that I want to avoid. While you could say, yeah, I want to approach having the Tome Stone gear, the weekly lockout is more of avoidance because it's just like, I don't want to lose that. Fifthly, we have humanistic theories of motivation. Now, this is actually one I think that is pretty cool and I think that it kind of does fit, so I do think it is relevant to talk about. So I'll flesh it out a little bit. I'm just going to cite their Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs triangle here. This triangle basically represents an organization where you have the needs at the lower tiers that need to be satisfied before you can be motivated for the higher level needs. That being said, this is just a primer on this and there are some evolutions to this model, so forgive me for cutting it down if you are aware of it, but I think for the purposes of this, this is going to be helpful. Uh, so basically, first off, you need food, water, and whatever else. These are your basic bare necessities. Then you need to make sure you're safe and secure, and once you're safe and secure, you start to worry about love and belonging, and then after that, you start to be motivated on self-esteem, and then you're motivated on self-actualization, or how to say it, reaching your self-actualization point. But specifically for this one, the, in reality, the parts that matter for gaming are mostly love and belonging, self-esteem, and self-actualization. So many aspects of this, this would include things like community and organized Blue Mage events, or Blue Mage FC doing groups like that. And it could be including being famous for making Blue Mage guides, or being known as the Blessed Blue Mage on Gilgamesh. Next thing would be self-esteem from being a Blue Mage, perhaps stuff like having all the skills would feel really cool to show off in cities to friends. And the self-actualization would be realizing one's own potential and possibilities with a Blue Mage, like maybe you're doing things that no one else has ever thought about doing and that you're really paving a path for something new. So that all being said, theories of motivation that are going to apply most directly here are the incentive, arousal, and approach of avoidance, and humanistic theories, sort of, all intents and purposes, I, that theory I feel is a little bit too broad to apply here. In terms of incentive and the approach theories, you're seeking some sort of gain in the game, or trying to minimize your loss. So this would be things like loot, gear, tone stones, activities from friends, and avoidance could be missing out on those opportunities to play with friends on Blue Mage. Arousal theory can relate to the novelty of playing the Blue Mage, and then the aspect of its newness and the novelty of the content being exhilarating at first. Next up, we have the Bartle Taxonomy of Player Types, which was first introduced in a 1996 paper by Richard Bartle, which determined what sorts of actions or motivations got players into the game, and ultimately what players wanted out of a game. 
This theory, however, does have some fundamental flaws that are outside of the scope of this discussion, but I want to kind of gloss over them real quick just so everyone's kind of on the same page. Specifically, this study was done back in 1996 and focused on MUDs, or specifically that is multi-user dungeons, and that's a relatively older style of game that was said to be a precursor to MMORPGs like Final Fantasy XIV. Other flaws exist, such as I personally took the test and I found myself feeling somewhat restrained on what to answer and like it wasn't actually giving my actual viewpoint. Likewise, you can see that this article has been adopted in a wide range of use cases on gamification and software design and usability, but before I begin, it's critical to realize that these categories aren't rigid and that many people may partially fit into a few different categories. In the article by Jenaki Kumar, Mario Herger, and Rick Dem states, most people have a dominant trait which determines their overall preference. So first off, we have achievers that are extremely focused on status and getting some sort of prestige to show off. Perhaps this fancy set of gear that someone wears in the middle of Limsa Liminsa. Perhaps this is a blue mage skill that you can spam in the city and show to everyone else and make everyone go, oh wow, this is cool. Oh, and this is like all about acquisition and status, progression and flaunting. Next up, you have explorers that want to learn more and engage more in various activities, and it is the novelty and the hidden potential secrets that drive the explorer types. This would include things like even trying out the blue mage in the first place. It's something new and something to engage in and like explore. Next up, we have the socializer type, which is more focused on interacting with others, and this would include things like gathering friends together to do a blue mage party against some extreme primal or something similar. Fourthly, we have the killer type, and they are more concerned about competition and less about points, and they want to see others fail and like really be dominant over them, more so than just achieving, achieving a set of PvP points. They gain gratification from the dominance and the potential humiliation of their prey. Now that leaves us with our third and last pit, bit of kind of scientific background, which is going to be on an article by Nick Yi, and so this is Motivations of Play in MMORPGs, and Nick Yi, a little bit of background on him, he's a highly experienced expert who's spent two decades researching psychology and gaming, including performing studies at Stanford University, and acted as a senior research scientist at Ubisoft, and the co-founder and analytics lead of Quantic Foundry, leading to his work being undeniably worth taking a look at. So while an in-depth look into this paper is something that I would enjoy doing and have done on my own, this is also out of scope, so I'm gonna just kind of focus on the three main components that split into 10 sub-components that he found from his research. Likewise, I'm going to cite his components and sub-components table here from his article. Three primary components he found were achievements, social, and immersion. Achievements split into three sub-components, yet advancement involving aspects like progression and status, mechanics such as number optimization and analysis, and competition such as challenging others and domination. Next up, we had the social, which split into the three sub-components, which is socializing like chatting, helping others, recruiting members into your free company, relationships that are on a more personal level, and giving some kind of support to those in need, and then thirdly, teamwork like collaboration, groups, and group achievement. Likewise, I do see this is a bit of a tie-in to the achievement categories, advancement, and competition in Final Fantasy XIV. And then lastly, our third main overarching component is immersion that's split into four sub-components. First off, we have discovery, such as exploration and lore, so things like the Blue Mage being novel and checking it out, roleplay, Limsa Luminza. Then we have customization including appearances, styles, and blue mage ability sets, and then we have escapism, just like escaping the real world and tuning into something cool and wild, which I think just generally applies to games. And now with all of that groundwork and science laid out, let's talk about the current state of the Blue Mage. So Blue Mage was introduced into Final Fantasy XIV this past January of 2019 alongside Patch 4.5. Similar to its Blue Mage predecessors, it featured a system where you battle monsters to learn abilities, and then you can set certain abilities together to form a particular loadout that's going to be kind of customized to whatever you play style you want. Spells that are acquired are located in your Blue Magic spellbook and then can be assigned as active actions where the maximum number of active actions that you can have is 24 and the current maximum book size is 49 skills at present, meaning that you can only choose about half of the current skills available or more skills have been stated to be planned for release in the future. However, this did come with the new overarching job mechanic called Limited Jobs. At the time of recording this video, the only limited job that exists is Blue Mage and to cite the console game's wiki page, the Blue Mage can't access duty roulettes, Eureka, Diadem, Squadron, missions, deep dungeons, PvPs, and they say Wolf's Den apparently, you also can't access Stone Sky C, and you can't access the Hall
call of the novice and likewise they cannot participate in any main story quests and cannot be assigned as a job to retainers however the blue mage also had one other fundamental difference from other jobs its max level was 50 with the addition of patch 5.1 coming in a few weeks of this video its max level is going to be 60. in terms of blue mage specific content the blue mage featured its own unique storyline that i personally did really find well done high quality as you'd hope for in a job in final fantasy 14 and I can recommend if anyone's interested in checking out that story, it is really good. And lastly, in terms of Blue Magic specific endgame activities, the Blue Mage's ultimate capstone is called the Mass Carnival. Essentially, this is a set of proms that will give you awards when you complete the prom. This also has the aspect of where if you complete it, giving a certain amount of constraints or certain types of constraints, and uh, such as a time limit or with water spells, you will get extra achievements. In terms of rewards, you specifically get some rewards for completing each of the currently 25 problems while in the carnival. Each week, three specific problems will be marked with a white, blue, and gold star, indicating that it has rewards for that problem to be done again. And if you do the challenge, getting all of the achievements marked here, you complete that week's challenge for that problem. The rewards for all of these are some gill, some allied seals, and some poetic tone stones. So with all of that being said, where did the Blue Mage go wrong? First off, you have no access to PvP on the Blue Mage, so the Bartle type of killers is immediately taken off the discussion, and the subcomponent of competition is for the most part removed. You don't have the aspects of domination, humiliation, forcing a loss on someone else, you, you don't have that aspect. A major point, in my opinion, is for starters, the level cap of 50 undeniably set the Blue Mage a staggering pace behind the rest of the jobs in the game. Level 50 was the level cap in A Realm Reborn, and our current level cap is 80 in game. This unfortunately is a problem that is not going to change much when it is raised to 60 with 5.1. So essentially, the Blue Mage has been locked into old content most players have done and seen numerous times for many, many years at this point. And while I do remember when trials like Rama Savage were relevant, I mean Rama Extreme, sorry, were relevant and hot new content this has been a very long time and has been long since finished likewise this also means that the rewards of blue mage are also trapped in the past the rewards from the mass carnival aren't helping this poetics are currency only used by past content and are unable to be purchased for relevant gear you can also buy certain crafting materials with them, this is true, but for most people that isn't great incentive and the markets for them generally aren't that in demand. In a similar vein, allied seals also aren't buying many relevant items. Level 50 gear sets aren't impressive, most of the items that you can buy from the NPC are generally not what most people are after. There are items for relic weapon quest lines for glamour that people could use like the un unidentifiable bone, unidentifiable seeds, and the alexanderites, but for the most part this is not stuff that people really want. That's not even getting into the fact that a 10k gill reward for completing the hardest weekly blue mage challenge is... Considering how I have saved well over 50 million gill to upgrade my personal plot to large, 10k just doesn't seem worth the hassle in the slightest. In terms of the blue mage, where else can we look for something to do? Something to farm or grind or achieve? Well, that is where we start to look at open world content and where we can farm old mobs that we can one-shot with our current jobs. Such as take the level 60 cap increase, okay now we can farm chimera mains, and these do sell pretty well, and do cost a decent chunk of gill if you want to go on the market board. Again though, why would I do this on the blue mage just to create an artificial level of difficulty when I can one-shot down Dancer and just get my loot? If we look back at the previous research we were looking at, in terms of motivation styles for both incentive and approach avoidance theories, the question whether the incentive is really good enough does come into question, and unfortunately the player base has reacted in kind. I personally do not know anyone in game that actively does the blue mage weeklies, including myself. Then you wonder what about avoidance, because then you're losing out on those weekly rewards. Unfortunately that loss isn't one that is much it's not one that you really feel that you've lost, because there just really isn't enough there to be worrying about losing it. Oh no, my 10k gill, whatever will I do, is not something that comes to mind. This related to Bartle player types by not really fueling the Achiever player type, and in return, Blue Mage cannot satisfy the achievement component, subcomponent of advancement or competition, as the Blue Mage is permanently stuck in the past. Now, getting into the second really core problem, is the limitation of the blue mage's kit as a problem and while yes the level 50 kit is an annoyance alongside all the other limitations we need to objectively look at the current blue mage kit as it is popping open the book we can see a host of damaging spells and some spells that can even massively reduce the damage taken making you much more tanky the problem comes with the limited scope and nature of this 
such as for me. I love playing more supportive roles, and so that's where I'm going to go out with this angle. My only real option here is White Wind, and for that, and the Final Fantasy Blue Mage and Final Fantasy XIV, it doesn't give me anything cool like diffusion, like I can't pass off my buffs even, which is seen in Final Fantasy XI's Blue Mage, which as I talked about earlier, they get the diffusion ability that will let them move their next buff onto their allies around themselves. Likewise, it doesn't have things like Astrologian's cards or Dancer's buffs or overall the general playstyle. Fantasy has kind of fallen flat on its face. You essentially feel very much like a DPS, and like that's all you really can do. Also given how it's only 49 maximum spells you can get, this also means that there's a limit on how far you can explore with the Blue Mage and learn new spells. Unfortunately, this is more than a fair thing, because reality is expecting infinite numbers of spells with infinite numbers of possibilities is just simply unfeasible to do in a world of limited software resources and a finite number of things that one could possibly do. Likewise, if we look at the motivation types, this would most closely tie in with arousal and perhaps also a humanistic theory of motivation. Essentially, this is new content with a new way of being able to gain skills and use them and combine them together. This is going to be very engaging and novel at first, because I, I can attest that it was very engaging at first. Problem is that after after a period of time, that ceiling is hit where there's no more novelty. You already have everything in your book, nothing's new, and no longer is it engaging and stimulating, and it just becomes another class where you have a list of skills that are the same as if you're playing any other job. You have the entire book fleshed out, and the acquisition method doesn't really matter, and fundamentally that is the problem with acquisition of skills. Once you acquire them, it's no different than if you just instantly unlock them in the first place, and unfortunately the ends do signal an issue here. But then you could say, but it's an achievement to complete the book, and that's true. But the problem is that once you have it, then what? Such as for myself, I did go to the lengths of getting most of the skills skills minus one. I just couldn't be bothered at that point if I'm being super honest, which I feel bad to say, but that's truly why I didn't go for that one, even though I have all the extreme primals. And it did feel like an achievement for the first bit. Part of the achievement is being able to show it off and it became very obvious very quickly after patch 4.5 that no one really cared. And actually, relating that to other points, that is where the social aspects, which is going to be my next point, come into play. But to wrap up this section on the Bartle type of explorer, really does suffer the same issue with finite number of quests, finite numbers of skills, and a small pool of possible skill sets given limited skills that we can use. Most interestingly enough, with the component and subcomponent model, we can see that immersion with discovery and customization and achievement is mechanical show that the Blue Mage absolutely has a solid edge on this at first, but due to the finite nature of the system, it does eventually run dry on this. My third kind of major, major concern is social events with the Blue Mage. Where are they? I know that this might sound flippant or coy, but that's not the my that's not what I'm trying to do. After the first few weeks on Blue Mage, I honestly stopped seeing people try, like not even trying to get extreme primal farms going. I remember when I went into those party finder with four people and I mean seven other people but four would play their max level jobs and four would play blue mages and we would just trade skill farms. I have yet to see a single event planned around the blue mage either through players or some sort of special dev team event. There's simply no real community around this and likewise I personally believe that that has a lot to do with the first problem that I was talking about about it just not being rewarding and that there's no incentive. And so how do you make a community based around something that is so engrossed in old content? I don't know. It, in terms of motivating factors, we aren't being driven in to try and do these from a social perspective because there is no real community around it. Likewise, the Bartle player type of socializer is left out to lunch. The Achiever has few people to show off their goals to and that actually really truly care that they unlock the Blue Mage abilities. And for the component and subcomponent model, unfortunately everything under the social category is unfortunately lost here. Kind of a thought on limitations and how you could potentially fix this is I'd say that the limitations need to go or at least ease off some of them and most importantly the level cap especially. Anything stuck in content that is four or six years old is doomed to be overlooked unless it has such a powerful and critical niche that you would suffer brutally for not doing it. In my opinion if Blue Mage could be level 80 at least now they would get access to Fates in Norvrant where they could farm bicolored gemstones and do hunts without worrying about being exploded than level 80 S rank, but that's actually another 
point that's worth discussing. Even if you don't explode, as a level 60 your damage contribution is not going to be nearly enough for hunts, unless your goal is to not get credit for that hunt. I can tell you, if you're gonna bother making it to the hunt and getting there on time, you want the credit. I also think in a similar vein that it would be really kind of fun to see like people farming mounts with the blue mage. Well, well you can argue blue mages can farm birds at level 60 with the massively enhanced drop rate, and the fact that you have people with their main state classes at level 80 come in and rain down kind of like nightmares on Sephiroth. I don't see that happening that much, it, but of course this isn't to say that no one is interested in doing that. Look at this reddit post. That also has down votes, and that took a decent bit of hunting to find, and there were a few YouTubers who were doing uh, minimum eye level prior content, such as I can recommend Scott Zone, although unfortunately I do believe he has moved away from Final Fantasy XIV. So am I saying that there is no community for it? Nope. In fact, I just gave evidence for the opposite. But the problem is this part of the community is extremely, extremely, extremely small. So now the question following that would be how many of these people are willing to do the same but with blue mages in the party? Would people be willing to do extreme trial farming? The level 60 cap increase come 5.1. Well, after seeing the level 50 cap with extreme primals for horses, no. At least I could not find anything about blue mage horse farming parties myself. And then the next idea would be, okay, what if you tied some wild glamour to it? Well, the question then becomes, is it tied to blue mage? Or is it only usable on casters? Or is it on every job in the game? Such as, say, some giant blue glowing staff with monsters on it that everyone can glam for the weapon regardless of class. I don't know, I'm just trying to come up with an example. If it's locked to just blue mage, I can see people shrugging it off again, unless it's something so glowy, so extravagant, and so blinding it makes the Heaven's Ward relic weapons look dull. And good luck with that. Okay, so what about some premium housing items? Well, I remember getting this puppy from Heaven on High. Oh, you thought I meant an actual puppy? No, just this thing. So, do you know how many people have asked me about this or exclaimed about this? None. Not one. Or what about the entire Dolmen Enclave that boiled down to a few cosmetic items and housing items? I legitimately haven't entered that map for months and months now. Honestly, the first time I've entered it in months is to record this video. So no, unfortunately not even that. The flip side is the, those who want the housing item or whatever will do the content and then drop it like I have, which is unfortunately very similar, likewise, the Dolmen Enclave to how I treat a blue mage. And I don't think that I've used it with any level of seriousness, seriousness since February. So again, this isn't something that's going to make people want to really play and stick with the blue mage. So the next question becomes, what if you've raised the level cap and put in some content like Eureka content? Maybe Eureka 2.0 for level 8 or something like that. And I know some of you are groaning at hearing Eureka, but if you think about it, Eureka with blue mage, this would actually have been pretty cool. We got a little bit of a taste of that with the customizable logo sections, and I really, really did like the diversity of playstyle that they offer. They they, they, well, I guess diversity in playstyle, that's a bit, uh, that's a bit, uh, but it was a little bit of a change of pace, and I did appreciate that. But that was until they cost so much to make the ones that I actually wanted to use that I literally stopped using logo sections at all. Two fully complete weapons later, I can say that I use the logo sections very, 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 very rarely, purely due to the cost. But suppose the blue mage was allowed in Eureka. I actually really think that'd be really cool. So we are grinding open world PvE content for glamour weapons that look really cool and then we're using this cool blue mage class that we can customize. It'd be even cooler if we could tailor our skills for certain fights, say we could reduce wind damage done by 20% on Pazuzu or something like that. Or maybe one blue mage like me would be a buff bot with so few, <laughs> with like a few heals to trickle in and another would be like a debuff bot. And actually I really think that that would be an interesting note to end on. See, the problem isn't the idea of Blue Mage. I think it's awesome. Many other people think it's awesome. It has a proven history of being one of the most beloved and iconic jobs in the entire franchise. You learn abilities from monsters, and then you can customize your entire kit to fit exactly how you want to play rather than be the exact same cookie cutter list as every other scholar or every other black mage out there. And honestly, I love it. The problem is it isn't relevant, and likewise that makes motivations, borrow player types, and component and subcomponent models fall to pieces. In terms of the motivations, there is no real incentive to play the blue mage, and likewise there is no goal or award to approach. And while you can say that there's a stimulation for the first portion of playing the blue mage, this unfortunately too does 
fade with the limited set of options and things to explore. For Bardo player types, the achiever is in a situation where they have nothing to really achieve. The rewards are unfortunately very marginal and there are very few players that are impressed by a fully filled out blue mage skill book. Likewise, killer players have nothing to kill because the blue mage is unable to participate in PvP. Socializers are starving for the connections that they crave because there is no real community engagement, I have not seen it. Or there's like, no real effort from the community towards the Blue Mage. And lastly, explorers may have a great time at first, but with so much novelty, it does wear off. And as they cap the book, it, it just, it's limited. And to go through Nick Yee's components of subcomponents table, advancement does exist because you can progress, but the problem is that most people don't identify the Blue Mage as their actual core character to advance, or at least not anyone I've been really talking to. This isn't, say, the same to them as if they were unlocking item level 470 Eden Savage gear to upgrade from item level 450 gear. As stated before, status and power are not a reality of the blue mage. Mechanics with optimization and analysis do exist for the various blue mage skill sets, but the problem here is that people don't optimize numbers for that. People optimize numbers for savage rage, the extreme trials and ultimate raids. They don't, and should probably not, be focusing on things like leveling roulettes and just general leveling content or how high a person is parsing on six-year-old it for the extreme content on the blue mage. It's just not something that the community does. And then next up we have lack of PvP meaning competitions out. You can say competition is to fill the blue mage spellbook as fast as you can, but that's not really something that I've heard at all. There, There is no world first blue mage book capping. And socializing is something that the blue mage could really benefit from and I do think that that'd be really good. But like I said earlier in the video I tried and tried and tried to find something like this but I can Even the mass carnival inherently is a solo activity and you can't do it with someone else. I mean, yeah, you can follow someone else's guide if you want to, but you're not like doing it in tandem with someone else. In terms of immersion, this is the one leg that I think that the Blue Mage does stand on. The quest and the setting skills and fleshing out your own fantasy absolutely does play into like the discovery, role playing, customization, and I think escapism too. Although escapism is more kind of general gaming in uh, less specific to Blue Mage. But one concern with customization is, as I said before, I can't really make my Blue Mage a heal buff. Bot. Like a world in, like I would in World of Warcraft Classic with my Paladin, my Holy Paladin. <laughs> Customization feels much more limited and much, much, much more DPS focused. Likewise, that stunts my ability to customize and roleplay as the Blue Mage healer that learned only healing and helpful spells from the lovely fairies of lore. I don't know. I don't do this often, and so yes, that did suck. I suppose a larger problem is that in spite of immersion being here in some form, that it doesn't seem to be enough. Or rather, the question becomes less immersion-wise, why would I play the blue mage to be immersed in the world when I can play my black mage? Blue mage is in its own little bubble that, if it was in its own little bubble, it would theoretically be great. But it's not, and so if someone is coming along wanting to discover Shadowbringers content that they can't even do as blue mage, likewise they can't focus on escapism by doing new content with it. And then the achievement and socializing components come crashing down to make the blue mage undeniably something that many players look at to either meme on or with frustration that the blue mage could have been envisioned to be something else or resources allocated somewhere like we had so many theories about a Rabans being like a blue mage like that was definitely a running theme for a few months there but of course that is far 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 out of the scope for this video I think we've covered this reasoning in more than enough detail at this point with all that being said, if you like this video and want to help support my content, any likes or subscribes would be super appreciated. As a newer content creator, any help really, really goes a long way, and I'd be really thankful. So what are everyone's thoughts on the Blue Mage at present? What motivates you or like doesn't motivate you about it? Or what would you do about fixing it? What sorts of new skills would you like to see enabled on it or like enabled playstyles? Let me know any of your thoughts in the comments down below. Anyhow, that's all for this video. Fun.